Thanks, Stephen. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, just so I, I can figure out whether I'm teaching granny to suck eggs or, or, or not. In terms of procurement, many people roughly would be on the procurement side here. Okay, about half. So there'll be a little bit of this that you'll know already, but I, I think procurement is no harm to get a refresher on some of this stuff. Um, anyway, um, I'm going to go through just some general principles and uh, and then wrap in the, the national uh, finance regulations, um, just as Stephen talked about in terms of the the relationship between the budget holder is the person who who's to figure out well what is it we're going to buy and the, procure, the input of the procurement uh, uh, function in terms of facilitating that purchasing process. Um, and the first thing to say in relation to procurement is uh, procurement is effectively a regulated sector. It's not considered like a regulated sector because it doesn't it doesn't behave in the same way as regulated sectors do. So, uh, but it is similar to say selling insurance products. You can't sell insurance products on, uh, uh, unless you've got a license to do so. Anytime the public sector wants to buy anything, procurement is relevant. So every single time there's a purchasing decision made on anything that's being bought, um, public procurement considerations apply. Uh, what you're buying, what's the value, what kind of procedure you're going to use, all that stuff. As soon as the, the, the decision comes into uh, into your head in terms of a, a purchasing decision, you have to be thinking about uh, your public how that sits in a public procurement environment. And that's why I say it's effectively a regulated form of, of sector because there are rules which apply to those decisions. And in relation to those rules, there are there's effectively the, the external regulated uh, environment, which is the EU for the high level uh, or high value uh, procurements and then there are the national uh, uh, levels in terms of thresholds which apply and then there's the internal environment which is the uh, national finance regulations and the rules that are in place around that which effectively support and inform uh, the external environment. Taking a sort of a helicopter view, procurement is effectively a subset of competition law um, which again is not something people uh, tend to uh, very much focus on. It's all about promotion of competition and cross-border trade. So that's sort of at a very, very high level where procurement comes from. So the idea is that you have competitions for things and above a certain level you have competitions on an EU-wide basis to make sure that people from other countries are entitled to, uh, to bid for them. So... Uh, and the idea is that there's a uniform set of rules across the EU that allows people to compete on an equal basis, hence uh, the EU directives. Uh, there's, a, there's a few sort of practical takeaways. Uh, procurement, a lot of procurement is actually, is actually common sense. Um, uh, I know a lot of people say find the, the, the rules can be difficult to navigate or they say there are grey areas, but there are, there are a few uh, fundamental principles and if you stick to the fundamental principles, by and large, you should be all right. Um, so there are four fundamental principles, equal treatment, transparency, non-discrimination, and proportionality. And generally, how I, how I suggest to people in terms of how they apply those, if you had someone sitting on your shoulder and you were about to make a decision, the person on your shoulder would say, if someone, else, if someone were to look at that from the outside, how would that look? So, for example, if you're going to ask one bidder to provide... Uh, or allow a tender to, to be submitted late or, or allow someone to change their price how would, how would that look and the person who, who is really how would that look is the, is the person who hasn't been given that opportunity which is generally other bidders so um, those fundamental principles if you have that sort of how, how, if I do such and such how is that going to look in terms of my, my obligations to everybody else who's involved here I mean I find that sort of second voice, if you like, a, a useful sort of litmus test to, to, to apply when you're, when you're dealing with, with procurement issues. Um, we'll get in in a moment to the thresholds and which procedures apply and that kind of thing, just to give you a very brief overview. But uh, these fundamental principles should apply regardless. Um, regardless if it's Annex 2B, which is for healthcare services, regardless of it's whether it's over uh, 200 grand, which for services, or 5 million for works. When you're, when you're buying anything, you should be applying these, these principles, which is, is to be fair. And generally speaking, I'd always make sure that you have some form of competition or some sort of audit as the base upon which you make your decisions. 
So just touching briefly on, on some of the, the, the high-level EU requirements, um, purchases for services and supplies over 207,000 uh, and works over 5 million require um, a, a, the EU formal rules to apply. EU formal rules uh, drill into things like timelines, what procedures uh, you apply, what information you need to give to people, and also what information you need to give people when they're unsuccessful. And there are, and there are specific rules uh, in the in the directive, which are our Irish law, which you're you're obliged to comply with. So, in terms of procedures, and some of you will be familiar with this or not, there are effectively there are uh, currently four procedures. There's an open procedure, which is as, as the name suggests, open to everybody. So it tends to be it's a one-stop shop uh, process. You send out your tender documents, and people can can respond. It's intended to be for straightforward types of procurements, think paper clips, uh, stuff like that. Um, restricted is is by its nature uh, restricted. I you're restricting the the tendering stage to a shorter list or number of people. So you have a you have a pre-qualification stage, which is effectively a filter. So you're testing. Well, can you actually do this for me? Are you do you have the, a big enough turnover? Do you, have you got experience? You test those things first. You shortlist to a, a smaller number, usually a, a, at least five, and then you ask and then you ask those people to to tender. So you're restricting it to them. Competitive a dialogue and negotiated tend to be used for much more complex. Uh, procurements, ICT, uh, PPPs, those type of, of, of constructs where you need to engage with the bidders and have consultations with them to make sure that they're delivering outcomes that, that you require or you need to talk about your specification uh, with the bidders. So generally it's a sort of, you're going to look at the experience of people first to see if they can do the thing for you and then you're going to, to ask them to tender uh, after that to a, a specification. Going back to the what Stephen was saying about the Procurement plan. Um, uh, I think when you're when you're even when you're going back to your procedures and what you're going to to buy, um, setting up, you know, setting up. Well, what is it I'm going to buy? How complex is it? Do I need to engage with the market? Um, uh, what is the value of that contract? Will inform even the decisions that you make at the very start of the process. So uh, I, I I think. Procurement plans being a three-year, I think it's a three-year annually, annually updated. So it's a, a three-year plan, which can be difficult to to to, to look forward in a, on a three-year basis. But a three-year plan, you need to look at at things like what type of engagement do you need with the sector when you're going through purchasing decisions. Um, the Second element then to that is if, again, these are all above threshold, these are the time limits. So how much time are you going to have? Uh, do you need something urgently? Um, I always try to forward plan to build in the time that you require to evaluate tenders um, uh, to comply with any specific timelines uh, which, I've, which I've mentioned uh, there. There are specific um, rules around, again, this is something that, that people aren't aware that there are actually regulations uh, or, or that deal with this. Um, if you've got award criteria or even if you've got sub-criteria, you have to disclose them. You have to tell the bidders what they are. Sometimes they well, you know, if we've got 10 here, actually we're going to break the 10 down into 4, 3, and 3, but we're not going to tell them the 4, 3, and 3 because that's just a sort of internal function to help us in our marking process. That doesn't work. You have to, do, you have to disclose breakdowns. Uh, because <coughs> the argument that people throw or bidders will throw will say, if I had known that, I could have done something else or I would have done something else. If I had known that you had a particular emphasis, emphasis on such and such an element, well, I would have recut my tender uh, accordingly. And that, that might necessarily be true, but that's the argument that gets thrown at you. And um, the difficulty being on the, on the awarding authority side is that if someone is asking a question in relation to how you con conduct your, your purchasing decisions, you have to justify the steps that you've taken each time, so you're always on the back foot, and um, so it's always better to have a, to have the more transparent you are, the more likely you are to be to be safe. Um, and this is the test, basically, in terms of when you're going out to market again, in the in the discussions that you might have as between a budget holder and 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 the procurement support, um, setting out your specifications, setting out your your tender documents. You're thinking, well, how would people understand this if they were reading it? So, and there is a, a, a test, the, the reasonably well informed, normally diligent tenderer test, so, or, or rewind or rwind tenderer. So, when you're sending out a, a document, 
It's not necessarily what you think it means. It's what someone who might be tending for, uh, for this would think it, it, it means. Now, that doesn't mean that two bidders can't interpret something slightly differently, but it needs to be capable of being interpreted in the same way. And a lot of the time, uh, when I get uh, calls in relation to procurement matters, it's around that kind of thing. Um, some bidders complain, saying, well, I didn't understand it to mean such and such, and if I had known this, I would have done uh, that. And again, we need to be in a position to say, well, look, we had a discussion, we were setting this out, this is what we understood, our, our specifications were clear, and we proceeded accordingly. Um, so as to have an eye, that would be a sort of another, in that kind of second voice stuff, to have an idea when you're, when you're setting out your requirements, your specifications, are they sufficiently clear? Feedback, now this is something, again, in, the, in an EU context, where you have large value contracts, um, you are obliged to provide feedback uh, uh, to bidders. Um, it needs to be in a letter, um, a, a specific form of letter where you're providing them with the relative advantages and characteristics of the unsuccessful tender against the one that's been successful. So you're saying uh, your tender was good but the successful tender was better and it was better because. Uh, and that's what I'd be thinking. A lot of the time evaluators are concerned about doing that because, well, if I tell them why, why I thought something was better than the other, well, they're going to disagree with me and then I'm going to get in trouble. Uh, Actually, that's, that's not an assessment which people look behind. So, so the exercise of professional discretion is something you're absolutely entitled uh, to use. If you are the person who knows what the service or supply is, you have evaluated a response in relation to it, you're absolutely entitled to take that view. And a court, a judge isn't going to stand in the shoes of, of an evaluator and say, well, that shouldn't have been a six, you should have given them an eight, and if they'd got an eight, they'd have won the competition. You know, we have a problem. Uh, the, a, a judge will look at, at the process by which decisions are, are come to, not the actual six versus eight. They just don't get involved in that. So I wouldn't be concerned uh, uh, about that. Um, but you do need to inform unsuccessful bidders in those circumstances about that type of analysis. Then there's the standstill period, which is a 14-day period. But it's kind of a, um, a cooling-off type period, to use that sort of consumer phrase. Um, between, between the time which you appoint your preferred bidder and you actually uh, award, award the contract. Um, a lot of focus in Ireland at the moment on remedies. Basically, you don't want to be sued. It's a, it's a, I'm, I'm, I'm much more about prevention than, than cure on this stuff. Um, uh, uh, if, if the HSE is, or a public sector body is sued, they cannot award the contract until those proceedings have been dealt with. Uh, once people are informed, and it's generally in the letter that you tell them when they're unsuccessful. They, they're informed that they've been unsuccessful and the reasons for that. Um, they have 30 days within which to issue proceedings, not write a snolly letter, to actually issue uh, proceedings. In advance of issuing proceedings, they need to send you a letter telling you that they're going to do that. So you will get the heads up in advance of the proceedings being issued, so should that arise. The position in Ireland at the moment, and we're the only country in the EU, uh, unfortunately, with this uh, position, is that uh, in other jurisdictions where someone issues proceedings, a public body can go in and say, this stuff is super urgent, uh, there might be an issue here in relation to the uh, procurement process, but this is urgent and we need to crack on and award uh, the contract. Judge, can you please make an order allowing us to do that? Uh, that's routinely done in, in, in other circumstances. Here, you don't have that right. So a public sector entity, even if the thing is... is is urgent. If someone's uh, put the kibosh on, on a tender process by challenging it, you're not allowed to award that contract until those proceedings have been completely dealt with, which, which generally speaking takes at least 12 months. So it's, it's, now it's something that's a prob that will be changing in the, there's a new directive which I'm going to touch on in a minute with, that they're looking at uh, fixing here, but currently the position in Ireland is that we don't have a right to lift what's called the automatic suspension. Um, uh, and that's causing significant problems with procurements at the moment because all you have to have is one unsuccessful bidder and it generally tends to be incumbents who are, who are unsuccessful where it actually might make more commercial sense for them to issue proceedings to stop the procurement being awarded so that they can continue to receive uh, uh, services or supplies uh, while the thing is working its way through the courts. So it's a bit of a disaster scenario really. Just touching very briefly on the, there's a new directive and we have until, Ireland has until, uh, I think it's April next year, to put Irish regulations in place in relation to it. What it does, it sort of, it, it updates 
procurement is all about case law, so it, it's, it updates the previous directive by reference to all the cases that have happened since 2004, which is the last one, um, and kind of codifies those. Um, there are a few things in there that will be relevant, particularly on the health care and shared services type side. Um, there's a new procedure uh, permitting horizontal cooperation between public bodies. So if you have two public bodies who are engaging in a, uh, a function, uh, independent functions for the common good, where there's no private capital uh, participating, they can engage in a, in a contract as between themselves without that contract having to go to, to, to procurement. So that is something um, uh, between voluntary organisations and, and uh, uh, healthcare uh, providers that might be used uh, going forward. Um, innovation partnership for, for research and development is something I've, uh, I've already got some queries in relation to. There's a previous exemption on, on research and development saying, uh, well, this is, an, this is a contract for, for something that, that we're just going to, to test or pilot, and therefore um, we, we rely on the exemption that's there. What generally happened was that you would have a product or supply or a service at the end of that, and that product or supply service would actually require a separate procurement then, which was didn't really make sense. So they've, they've introduced a what's called a, a innovation partnership procedure, which allows you to both go through that piloting R and D type phase, and also to take the benefit of anything anything that comes out of that without having to run a separate process. Now it does mean that the R and D stuff will require um, you to engage in, in procurement processes uh, going forward. There's big emphasis on use of lots in the new directive. In fact, you're going to have to justify why you're not using them. There'll be a little box where you have to explain we are not using lots because this contract shouldn't, you know, doesn't lend itself to be split into lots. And the whole idea is, is promotion of SME participation in, in tender processes. Now you can, like, you can uh, proceed to, to award contracts without uh, splitting them up into lots, but you'll need to justify why you're doing that. Um, there are new rules around abnormally low tenders. Um, so if you get something that was, it's just clearly uh, off market in terms of price. Previously, the position was, well, you only had to really investigate that if you were going to kick them out. If someone wanted to pitch in uh, very cheaply and you were happy that they could actually deliver the service, you could go ahead and award that contract without any further investigation, um, other than being satisfied it was deliverable, really. Whereas now, every ab ab abnormally low tender has to be investigated whether you're going to accept it or reject it. There are new rules around uh, making changes to awarded contracts. This is something that is often missed, um, I think, um, in procurements that you think, well, once I've got my contract awarded, I'll stick it in the drawer, and if we need to make changes after that, that's fine. Um, it's not quite the case. You're still in a regulated environment, so the test being that, well, if I'm going to make changes to the contract now, it takes a stupid example. So you uh, award a contract for 12 months, and you say, "You guys are doing a brilliant job. I'm going to. I went out with a 12-month contract. I'm going to give you another three years." So it's turned from a one-year contract. I'm just exaggerating, for example, uh, uh, purposes. Um, and it's now a four-year contract. Would you have had the same people come forward for a one-year contract as a four-year contract? Um, they're getting the benefit of the additional three years without going to tender. So that, that would be a clear example of, of a material change to the original contract that you awarded requiring a retender, and there are now specific rules which deal uh, with that. Uh, another thing to note, because sometimes I think this is useful, although the limit might necessarily be ideal, uh, a maximum of, of um, a twice the, the, the contract value being the, the overall contract value for turnover purposes. Sometimes people scratch their heads a bit as to, well, it, I'm not quite sure what, what level to set at turnover when you're asking people to demonstrate do they have the financial wherewithal to deliver a contract for you. So there are specific rules on that. So that's a sort of the EU. So when you come, uh, and that's for the, once you hit those thresholds of, of the 200 grand uh, and the 5 million. Then you're into the sort of the domestic or, or national requirements, which is basically anything over, um, anything over 25,000 euro needs to be stuck up on, on e-tenders. Um, and it has to be, and that's the entire contract value. So, if you're, if you have a contract for which is twelve and a half thousand per year, um, it's twenty five, and it's a two, it's a three year contract. Then you add the, the, the three twelve and a half up. Um, you, you can't just look at it at it on an annual basis. You have to aggregate the, the the total value of the contract, 
and that includes even for things like frameworks where you might not have an idea, thanks John, um, uh, an idea of the overall value uh, in specific terms, but you have to have an, a sort of a general ballpark uh, in terms of setting the contract value. Uh, below 25, it, there's still an obligation to, to, to seek written quotes between 5 and 25 uh, K, so it should be three written uh, uh, responses from the market, and below 5, uh, I think it's verbal uh, quotations. Again, I'd say that the best practice standards in terms of fundamental principles, having a competition, uh, setting out your award criteria, that kind of thing, should all apply for those smaller uh, contracts. As Stephen was saying earlier, not every single contract is subject to, to procurement land transactions. Um, currently, the research and development and pilots, loans and finance arrangements and employment, there's a sort of a, a group of, of contracts that don't uh, lend themselves to, to public procurement and aren't captured, um, uh, but the, the exceptions are, are quite narrowly construed, so you need to be pretty certain that you've, you fit within one before you'd want to rely on one. Um, uh, uh, so, I, as I say, as Stephen was saying, I think, uh, and I have had occasion where we're trying to to see if we fit within uh, certain exemptions, and I can't. Sometimes it's not terribly straightforward. But uh, so, limited number of exceptions, narrowly construe them, be absolutely satisfied that you're that you sort of it's a slam dunk in terms of of, of sitting inside uh, an exception if you want to apply or to use one. Um, again, a sort of a. A subset or a separate set of, of governance is the, the code of practice for state bodies, which is similar to some of the, the, the concepts that's dealt with in the national financial regulations, which I'm going to touch on now. Um, so the, the, the NFRs, um, they basically sort of, they mirror a lot of the, the principles that you have in, in procurement uh, and, uh, requirements. So, and it's, it, it's, it's, there are regulations which apply as between the responsibility of the budget holder being the person who's, who's uh, needs to provide, uh, is making the purchasing decision ultimately and the facilitation that a procurement uh, that the procurement support might offer in relation to those purchasing decisions it has it's broken into uh, sections which deal with approval so appro approving actual uh, service or supply or whatever it is is being purchased how you go through the tender process itself how you deal with uh, receiving uh, the goods or services and payment uh, for those goods or services. And there are obligations as for, uh, principally for budget holders, but also for uh, procurement support around those those four areas. Uh, the NFR is applied to the HSE and to any entity which the HSE funds by 50% or more. So it's not just, it obviously has a broad application to, to voluntary bodies and, and other organisations. Um, one of the key things... Um, uh, that the NFRs do is seek to separate or segregate the responsibilities between people who might be looking at tenders or evaluating bids for you and the people who have actually who have the purse strings and the idea is, is to is to instill or or structure a, a level of independence so that um, someone who's who's looking at a tender response uh, isn't necessarily driven by any particular factors, you have someone independent who has structured the tender process who can say this is good or bad by reference to what we asked for without, without any other uh, baggage for want of a, a, a better phrase. The, the budget holder, as, a, as, as Stephen was mentioning, uh, and as the NFR is required, there's a three-year procurement plan um, that is required to be set out by budget holders, um, forward thinking in relation to what your purchases, uh, what your purchases are, your timelines are for purchases are, are quite important. I think one of the key things to drive all of that will be the values of the of the contract because it'll once you hit trigger high levels. Um, I guess, um, once you hit high levels, then you're into into particular time limits, which which will obviously um, affect your ability to receive things by a certain point in time. Uh, it's not necessarily the case that if you just want to buy something, you have to go you, you go out and get it. Um, you're supposed to uh, manage your stock, so you shouldn't be going out to buy something you already have in a warehouse somewhere. Um, so that requires, obviously, understanding um, uh, what's in your stock. The budget holder is obviously responsible uh, for the payment of invoices, so that's not a function of the of the procurement um, facilitator. Um, so, and there are rules uh, to remind the budget holder about prompt payments and that kind of thing. 
and they're also responsible for managing supplier relationships. And just one thing to touch on there, um, a lot of the time I find that people will, will spend a lot of time uh, putting their specification together, um, setting award criteria as to how, well, you know, design's more important or price is absolutely important or whatever it is, you, you spend a lot of time at the front end as to what you actually want. And then once you award the contract, there's nothing in the contract to make sure you're getting what you actually asked for. Um, and that is something that's worth focusing on uh, a lot more going forward. In fact, there are new rules in the procurement directive allowing you to exclude people who have performed poorly on previous contracts. So, which I know is something that, that comes up uh, a, a lot, where you've had someone who offers you a, coal, a gold-plated service uh, and you don't get it, and then they come up the next time offering you a gold-plated service again, you're saying, well, I know from the last time that guy doesn't give me uh, the gold-plated service because he offered me that the last time he did, and I didn't get it. Um, the best way of, of um, securing good performance is regulating performance. So if someone has said, I will make sure that you get your supplies uh, or you get a response time of uh, 24 hours for any, any specific request, well, if they're consistently failing to meet uh, that target that they offered and which you've agreed to accept, you should be doing something about it. So your contract should include some form of performance uh, um, requirement. To, to, so you're actually, because that's what you, it's just, it just reinforcing, what did I buy? I bought this with a certain timeline and I'm paying for it. So uh, I, I should be entitled to make sure that I'm getting what I, what I paid for. And as I said, if it comes to uh, uh, poor performers, it, it's, it's good evidence to demonstrate poor, poor performance should you wish to uh, take steps to either uh, exclude or mark them accordingly uh, in subsequent tender processes. So the professional input, um, and that's how it's phrased in the NFRs, um, is, uh, is for any uh, contract over €25,000. So uh, yeah. anything that you're buying over €25,000 requires the input of, of, uh, of a professional. And as I say, it's intended to be a facilitation, so they're, they're intended to help uh, you establish a process by, what, by which the budget holder gets what it wants to buy. So in terms of a few things to note from in the NFRs, there, there are a minimum of two people uh, required for contracts over, over 25,000 uh, euro, and that's that split or segregation of responsibility between the evaluator and the budget holder. So the budget holder for a contract over 25,000, you can't have the budget holder being the person who, who runs the tender process from start to finish. There has to be a, an independent person in, involved. And as I say, the, the evaluator and the sign-off person for that reason have to be uh, separate. You're not entitled to, 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 to split contracts, and this is something that comes up in terms of, well, I'll tell you what, I'll buy something for 10 grand this week, and I'll buy something for 10 grand next week, and 10 grand the week after, and then it's, that means it's not, it's not over 25 grand, and therefore I don't need to get anybody else's advice. Um, that's not really uh, how this is supposed to operate. You're supposed to look at contracts in a, sort of in a reasonable or commonsensical uh, type way. Well, what are you actually buying? You're buying. <coughs> It's something that you require, not just this week. It's something that is a regular purchase, and you, you should really be aggregating those um, those amounts. You are required to look at, at existing stock before making any purchasing decisions. So again, for the uh, for the purposes of the the procurement plan, having an understanding of what what existing stock there is that you, perhaps you may have or may be available to you from other sources um, a, a, is something you need to do. Detailed receipts procedures around how goods are received, because you sometimes you do get issues about people saying, "Well, no, I delivered it; it was fine whenever I, it, it left our warehouse, and it was fine whenever it got to to, to your to your facility." So you can't complain about it now. Um, and ensuring prompt payment. The 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 other takeaway, really, um, I know it's a horrible phrase. I don't, compliance is a horrible, boring um, uh, phrase, but. Um, uh, uh, you won't be thanked for being non-compliant, and as I say, in applying best practices, which is just a sort of a, a mindset on how you structure your purchasing decisions, uh, uh, if people are informed across the board as to how uh, purchasing decisions get made and people have bought into that sort of concept, it effectively regulates itself after that. So, um, 
and it ensures it ensures compliance. So it's certainly something um, worth looking at in terms of just how to enforce or reinforce compliance. Preparation is 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 key. Um, having a, a dialogue certainly, obviously, for the, the stuff over over twenty five thousand between the budget holder and the uh, uh, procurement person is very important because um, it'll make sure you get the outcome that you require. Um, and understanding the roles that each individual in, in a supply chain plays. So who's the person who's going to specify what's required? Who's the person who's going to mark the, the, the tenders? Who's the person who's in control of the budget? That kind of thing. <coughs> and sometimes with procurement, it, it, it's one of those things that if you're not sure, if you're not sure of a, a contract value, if you're not sure if you need to tender, if you're not sure if you, if, what to do with the award criteria, it's useful to get another view generally anyway. And I'm happy to take any questions. I think, John, you had one final thing to say, and I'll take questions mm. after that. Yeah. Just, just before we go to questions, just to uh, recap on a couple of things uh, Stephen and Aaron mentioned around the, the, the three-year plan. Uh, we're we're going to be there to help you with that because our plan is to visit all the groups and the CHO areas, and to try and get a first swipe at a three-year plan at a at, at a local level and then at a at a national level, and then we can granulate up and back back down to local level, where we have a way of working which uh, has been launched on the fifth of March with with, with Tony and the section 38s and 39s how we're going to uh, apply the government decision that was held in uh, the. the the April 2013 last, the government made the decision around the Office of Government Procurement and the establishment of that office. So, um, <clears throat> just to mention a couple of things, when we had, when we were here the last day, uh, Michael Flynn made a point about risk, uh, and so did Stephen, and, uh, and, and the risk to the organisation isn't always internal. It, it can be around clinical, and it can be around the, the, the internal issues there, but sometimes we have risk around external and Aaron alluded to that we can be sued and so on, brought through the courts, and we have been, and thankfully we've been successful in those. Uh, and we have got, and we've been challenged without going to the courts. And when the companies find that we've actually done our procurement correctly, they actually back away. And the most recent uh, of that was uh, the blood sciences uh, contract in Cork and and Kerry. And the significance of that was that in the UK they can't bring those uh, contracts to bear, but it was because that we had a collective approach. And the, clin the clinicians, in particular, and the clinicians' requirements being to the fore of the of the of the of, of the contract, along with the procurement input and financial and management, along that a collective effort, we were able to bring that uh, contract, and that actually brings 2.2 million savings per annum over a seven-year period. Uh, that can be transferred into other services. So the significance of doing our work isn't always just about being compliant. There are benefits and efficiencies that can be brought about that. Um, in, in doing, one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you again was to explain the, the changes that have taken place in procurement because uh, since April 2013, the government actually said we want to do procurement right across the public sector. So they, they realised that from a report that was done, I think it's three and a half years ago now, with Accenture that said that there was 500 million to be saved in the public sector. And that was basically a book uh, figure that was taken a percentage of the overall spend uh, across the public sector, and they said there's 500 million in here. Now, we've been working on this for some time, and there's very few organisations, in fact, there's no organisation that can actually demonstrate and have audited figures to the tune of a quarter of a billion over the last five and a half years in savings, other than health. And that is without the figures from our colleagues in the, in, in the voluntaries on Section 39s who would have had to uh, draw down uh, savings and contracts and, and look for different ways of efficiencies uh, without collating them all together. But I'm certain that that figure would be up around 300 million uh, with those figures included. But the government decided that, um, OK, the OGP were going to do, uh, they're going to be responsible for policies and procedures right across the public sector. But in that, they recognise that there are specialties, and one of the specialties is health. Others are local government and defence and education. And these areas were big enough on their own to have their own separate uh, specialty uh, requirements. And as a result, they were left with uh, a procurement function. Now, if that wasn't the case, we'd be all working for the OGP now and you'd be going to central government for your services. Uh, we're unique in another way in that we have logistics and we have the National Distribution Centre, which is now running. It's now in Limerick and in Ennis. Uh, you know, and it's starting to be rolled out. It'll take two years to roll out. However, that will give us efficiencies and it will give us uh, compliance right across the stock 
element of, 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 of our business. And the other side of the sourcing will be supporting that plus the non-stock areas. But within those areas, we will be doing professional services, uh, the medical diagnostics equipment and the pharma. And the non-specialty uh, areas, we will be grouping and handing them through the OGP on your behalf. So we'll be working with you on the plans and then we'll be splitting it out as to what goes to the Office of Government Procurement on behalf of health collectively and what stays within. And the people who will be staying with, within will be doing the work from, from our own services, but others will be doing our work for us. And vice versa, we have health obligations across the whole public sector. So, for example, if social welfare are looking for doctors, they will come to us and we will find the doctors for them through contracts and so on. So that's just to give you an idea of, of the changing environment that's happening in procurement. It's, it's, it's an area that's uh, it's not complicated, but it's complex. Uh, and, 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 and we'll help you with that. Um, 4002, which I don't think we mentioned yet, uh, is circular where you put up your hand and you say, we've been non-compliant, uh, the CNAG required this, it's statutory, and they are looking for that by the 31st of March. We have a total of 217 returns, of which 10% are uh, nil returns. So if there's anything out there that you need to get on that register, I'd suggest you do. That helps us to help you in the sense of, at least we can say to CNAG, OK, we haven't gone to procurement on this issue, here's the reason why, but this is what we're doing about it. Instead of waiting for the CNAG to come in, find it, it's not on the 4002 and we all end up in trouble. So from that point of view, what I do is encourage you, it's still not too late, and even if it just does come in after the, the deadline, we can always say to the CNAG that we have a, a non-compliance area here that we're declaring, but this is what we're going to do about it. Uh, that's all about helping us. Um, it's not about uh, wearing hair shirts or anything like that. The wise thing to do is put it on the register. So I'll open it up to questions, therefore, to um, Stephen and to Aaron and myself, if anybody has any questions.